Okay, we're coming back trying to compare Mark and Hebrews to see if there is something particular that Hebrews is talking to in Mark that would help us know whether or not Mark came before or after Hebrews. So far, I'm getting ties that are thematic, but I'm not getting particular ties to establish which of these two Mark or Hebrews came first. Now, that could be because <clears throat> they're actually being written at the same time, so that the writer of Hebrews doesn't know what Mark is saying, <clears throat> and, the, and Mark doesn't know what the book of Hebrews is going to say. And that's another way of proving the divinity of a Bible book. Because if two of them are being written at the same time by two authors who don't know about each other, and yet they're talking about the same thing, and they really are, then obviously God had to coordinate both of those writers separately. Okay? Because they surely don't know about each other. And that might be the answer here. I really don't know. If that's the answer here, then all I can say is that they came out in the same year. And I'm sure that the book of Hebrews came out after Peter and Jude. But I can't tell you if Mark came out before or after Peter and Jude, except that Peter and Jude don't talk about anything specific in Mark either. It looks more like Mark is playing on Peter and Jude because of the themes. What's so distinctive about Mark <clears throat> and Jude and Hebrews and um, Peter, especially Peter, which seems to be first in order, is that they're all focused on the false teaching and the apostasy that's set in. And they're all in a hurry. Okay, well, for, Second Peter is more sedate, but Jude is in a hurry. Uh, and Jude is on Second Peter. It's wrapping around it, as I showed you. So how come Mark is in a hurry, Hebrews is in a hurry, sec First Peter was in a hurry, Jude is in a hurry, Second Peter is slower because Peter knows he's going to die. He's writing a deathbed letter. So he's all relaxed. Second Peter is very relaxed. And you can understand why. You know your end has come. It's finally over. You can finally just sort of go, oh, okay, I'm in the last stage of my life, finally. I mean, personally telling you about my own self right now, I wish I were dead yesterday. There's nothing here to want to live for except scripture. I have lost faith in everything else but Bible. And that's not to say that people are nasty or mean to me or anything like that. I just realized just how sick this world is and it ain't going to get better. Christians hate God and they pretend to love him and that makes me sick to my stomach. Nobody cares about what scripture says. And when I say nobody, I mean less than 1%. Almost nobody. But that's exactly what Paul said was going to happen in Ephesians, in the meter of Ephesians 3, 1, 13 through 14. So what right do I have to be discouraged? So as far as I'm concerned, I'm living to learn Bible better and screw everything else. I just don't care anymore. And it, it's not about anybody in particular. I'm not exactly bitter. But I'm really surprised that the human race, especially Christians, are so hypocritical. And that the scholarship in Christianity is so terrible. The scholarship in Christianity is like kindergarten level. 2,000 years have gone by and we're still arguing over whether God is one or three. Please. It's like what, what Hebrews says in chapter 5. Y'all should have been teachers by now. But instead, you're still focusing on the elementary stuff. Okay, so let's shut up with the brain out ranting and let's go on to Hebrews. See this? That's how he starts his letter. Immediately, you know, to use a key word in Mark. Immediately, straight away, right away, straight. Paul didn't write this. When Paul writes his letters, he makes a big stink about the fact that it's Paul. Paul's very personal, very chatty in his letters. Because he's writing to people he knows. This person is writing a very impersonal treatise on the change of covenant. Why from old to new? And he just starts right in. Now you can say, well, maybe the preamble was cut out. Yeah, you could argue that. But if Paul wrote it, 
Who would cut out the preamble? It's not Paul's writing style either. There's nothing chatty in this writing style. The closest writing style I can find to the Greek writing style of Hebrews is in Luke. Okay? The writer really knows, you know, Attic Greek. So did Luke. Luke played with Attic Greek. But did Luke write it? It's possible. But then why didn't Luke say it was him? Because whoever wrote this had, had, uh, uh, had authority over the people in Jerusalem and they respected him. So that doesn't make it sound like it's going to be Luke. Okay. But if I were picking based on style only, I'd say Luke. But I can't. All right. All right, so here we go. God, after he spoke long ago, go in these last days spoke through his son. Now you realize that the prophets were sort of heralds. They were heralds for God. They were messengers of God. They were telling the story about God before the end comes. Okay? So that's how Mark had opened up his gospel. With the herald. The first herald was John the Baptist. And then Christ himself, in a sense, is the herald of God. In the humanity of Christ, he's a herald of God as well as the Messiah. He's king. He's also herald. Because he's bringing in a kingdom. The kingdom is coming. He's the advance runner telling you the kingdom is coming. Okay? And so that's why it says here, all right, because this is, this is at John, G Jesus comes, see, now after John had been taken into custody. So now we're talking 27 AD or so. Okay, 29 AD, I'm sorry. Jesus came into Galilee. Jesus said this. Jesus is playing the role of Herod. Time is fulfilled because he's here. The kingdom of God is at hand, meaning him because he's the king. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark is quoting Jesus Christ. The repentance is a change of mind about what? The gospel. It is not repent of your sins. It's repent and believe in the gospel. So all those stupid people, like Kirk Cameron and all those idiots, the way of the master, they wouldn't know the way of the master if it bit them because they don't know the verse highlighted in blue at the left. Repent means to believe in the gospel. It does not mean repent of your sins to be saved. Now, maybe they don't teach that anymore. But in the beginning, the so-called way of the master with Ray, what's his face, and Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron. Those guys are apostate. They don't even know the gospel. They don't even give it correctly in those older days. Maybe they've changed their mind now. They've repented from their false doctrine of saying you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Because it says here, repent and believe in the gospel. So when it's truncated to repent in other verses, this is what it meant because Christ that was his first message when Christ first announces himself this is what he said now that's unique to Mark okay this whole the, the, the words here are unique to Mark so now we have something that's unique to Mark now look at the right hand side Hebrews 1 in these latter days, he's spoken to us what? In his son. Left-hand side of the text. That, we could argue, is talking directly to Mark because those words on the left-hand side are unique to Mark. The other Gospels have snippets and parts of saying this, have parts that are saying this, but none of them say this whole sentence. That's unique to Mark. See, after John had been taken custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God, saying this. That's a full sentence, a full quote of Christ by Mark, unique. Parts of that quote are in the other gospels. All right? So this is an instance where Mark slows down, and instead of just quoting the other gospels, He's giving the, you the full quote that the other Gospels don't give you. Because the other Gospels don't say this. They say repent. And they, they truncate it. Because repent was shorthand for this whole phrase. That Christ himself said. So all those people saying you've got to repent of your sins to be saved. Are ignoring this. 
here's your definition of repent. Okay? Which everybody at the time heard it, knew that already. So the writers of Matthew and Luke, they didn't need to say the whole sentence because everybody knew what it meant. Except us dumb Christians who aren't reading all the gospel before we start shooting off our mouth. Okay, so the left-hand side, the son is speaking, right? God, after using the prophets, which were heralds, in many ways said through his son, so now I can sit there and say, okay, this looks as close as a direct reference to Mark, because on the left-hand side, this is the only place it appears. That looks, that's as much of a, you know, direct reference as I'm going to find so far. What's troubling is that I don't find the word toreo, meaning to keep, that's used prominently in Mark and, um, I mean, in uh, Peter and Jude. I don't find it used in Hebrews at all which is like, why? Because it's such an important verb. And I don't find the word immediately, or yutus, used in the book of Hebrews either. Now, I do find synonyms. But synonyms, it's like, why am I finding synonyms if he's pointing at the scripture? See, if Mark is prior to Hebrews, then Hebrews has got to have something in it that points directly at Mark. And all I can find that is really close was that reference in 5.11, Hebrews 5.11 through 6.6 that's pointing at Mark 4, 24, and 29, but that's kind of a weak link. You know, it's talking about the water, you know, in Hebrews versus, you know, the soil in Mark. Because it takes water to grow. And that was a unique passage in Mark. Okay, but now if you look on the screen here, you see on the right-hand side, Hebrews saying, spoken to his son. And that could be a direct reference, because that's exactly the theme of Mark's gospel. Is the herald, make straight, get ready. And here's Jesus Christ acting as the herald, even though he is the king also. Talk about humility, boy. I wish I had that humility. All I want to do is shoot people who won't listen to him. Okay? Spoken to us through his son. Aren't you glad I'm not God? <laughs> okay, on that note, I'm going to sign off for now. Okay, so now we're coming to another thematic um, tracking between Hebrews and Mark. Again, because it's a theme rather than direct quotes, it's a little iffy to say that Hebrews is talking back to Mark. It's just as possible to say that both these two writers are writing on the same things in a coordinated manner at the same time, but they don't know that they're coordinating with each other. God's doing the coordinating, the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we saw in Hebrews 1, um, on the left, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus Christ acting as herald, and he's also the king whose road needs to be made straight. Prepare for him. Okay, we also saw in Hebrews 1 that he spoke to us through his son in the latter days. So it that's a real possibility that Hebrews is talking back to Mark because in the left-hand side of Mark, that particular phrase, that whole sentence, that's the only place it appears in the Gospels. The Gospels use snippets of time is fulfilled, like in Luke 4.19. Kingdom of God is at hand. That's a refrain in Matthew, and it's also expressed in Luke. But this phrase is nowhere in the first two Gospels. This part is, and this part is, but they're not hooked up together. But Mark is quoting Christ. See? Jesus is saying this. So obviously the snippets, this part and this part, are shorthand versions of his, see, because this is supposed to be his initial announcement. This is supposed to be the first thing he says after he comes into Galilee when John was taken into custody. 
So he is taking John's place. That's the point that Mark is making. The herald, now the king, that the herald heralded, because you know John was prophesied um, in Malachi four. Okay, I think it was four, last chapter of Malachi. And he was the herald for Christ. He is six months older than Christ and is the cousin, is his cousin. But Christ is Messiah, he comes into Galilee replacing John and saying this, that's the full quote. See, it's a full quotation. So the other gospels just use parts of the quotation here in here and then they use the shorthand of repent to see anybody who heard Christ make his official announcement would know that the word repent is the first word in that whole phrase and that's a frequent thing in Greek writing is to use the first word or the first item in a bullet list and it stands for the whole list see the time is fulfilled is shorthand for the whole quote. The kingdom of God is at hand is a shorthand for the whole quote. Okay. And when Christ announced himself in um, Luke 4.19, he's saying scriptures are fulfilled, quoting uh, Isaiah 61. Scriptures are fulfilled in your hearing. Well, the only one who could quote and say that of Isaiah 61 would be Messiah. Only Messiah was eligible to say that. So he was declaring himself as Messiah at that time. Okay? So here you go. This is the repeated message he was making over and over and over. See what it says in saying? It means that he was doing it over and over and over. Alright? So, that plays to Hebrews 1. Or Hebrews 1 place to it. Take your pick. Because it's the only place that it can play to. If Hebrews is playing on Mark, this is the only place it can play to. If Mark is saying this in light of what Hebrews says, then Mark is playing on Hebrews. He's picking a real quote the Lord really said when he really started out in 29 AD. Okay. And he was just about to be 30 years old in the 15th year of Tiberius. And you have to count Tiberius co-regency when you do that calculation. Because Tiberius co-regency began in AD 12. Okay? So, well actually you don't. Is it 15 and 12 is 27? You don't count the co-regency, sorry. When Luke is writing 15th year of Tiberius, he's not counting the co-regency. Okay. Sometimes you count it, sometimes you don't. Okay, so... Jesus comes into Galilee in the 15th year of Tiberius when he's about 30 years old because he turns 30 after Tiberius comes into power. Tiberius accession, accession was uh, in September. Jesus is about 30 years old because his birthday is on Hanukkah. So here we go. That's his message. So Hebrews 1 is either talking back to Mark or Mark is talking back to Hebrew because that's the only passage in the Gospels that Hebrews could be talking to. Okay? So, you take your pick what you want to say about that. Now, here's our next instance. Sorry it took me so long to get to the point. Right hand side, Hebrews 2 1. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You can't neglect a salvation you don't already have. So he's writing to believers. How will we escape? See, for this reason, we want to pay. See, the reason of this happening, Operation Footstool, my pastor likes to call that verse. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so we don't drift away. That's going to be the theme of his, the rest of his letter. For if the word spoken through the angels, because they used to teach scripture, and he's playing on Jude here. Okay. You know the Jude verse about Enoch. I'm not. Yeah. About Michael and Satan. Proved unalterable and every transgression received a just penalty. That's what Peter and Jude were talking about. Okay. How will we escape? And that's how Peter ended. Is that the judgment of God. It's time for the judgment of God to come. And it has to start with us. The house of God. Okay. It's obvious that Hebrews is playing on Peter, wrapping around it. Okay, that, that's real obvious. 
but it's not so obvious as whether it's plain to mark. Well, here's another instance where it might be. How will we escape if we neglect so great a deliverance? See, because it's coming out in a rush because the temple's about to be destroyed. There are believers who are still in Jerusalem who aren't listening that they should get out of Dodge. All right, all the apostles have gotten out. They got out back in 64. Jude was written in 66 is what it looks like. 66, 68 rather. 68. So we'll just be charitable and say somewhere between the two dates. Luke is dating his own letter of 66 AD. But their 68, 66 AD. But their 66 would be our 68 going by Paul's Anno Domini accounting in Ephesians 1. So how do we escape if we neglect? Neglect. Not ignore. Neglect. You neglect something you own. You neglect a relationship you have. You neglect property you own. So you have salvation. You can't neglect what you don't own. You can't neglect what you don't have. So this is written to believers. So anybody thinking that Hebrews 6 is addressed to unbelievers, they can't read the Bible. Because he's telling you, hi, this is my next theme. This is why I'm writing. Because we're neglecting it. And like Peter said, the judgment has to come to us first. And now he goes after it was first spoken through the Lord. Okay, left-hand side of the screen. Again, Mark is the one who's putting that through. See? In the last days, the prophets. The last prophet is John. Okay? Jesus Christ is the announcer of our salvation, left-hand side of the screen. See, he's leaving out the prophets now because he established that the prophets came and then they got replaced by Christ as Herald. Okay, well, left-hand side of the screen, Christ plays Herald. You see the point? And then it was confirmed to us, the writers of Scripture, the apostles, the believers, by those who heard. This is answering John 17 prayer, but John 17 hasn't been written yet. But still everybody knew about it. God also testifying with them. That means those who were confirmed. Who heard him. God also testifying with them. Now here's the next key point that ties to Mark. Both by signs and wonders. And various miracles. And gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. That is the next big theme in Mark in particular. That is the specialty of Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel is very biting. It's very satirical. Okay? His whole focus in his gospel, you can sit down and read it even in translation. It'll take you about an hour. He keeps on harping constantly on the miracles and the signs and wonders that were not believed by the, the Jews at the time. And the reason Mark is harping on it Okay, he does. He covers very little doctrine in his letter. He focuses on that right-hand side blue theme. The right-hand side in Hebrews 2, 4 is the theme of Mark's gospel. As distinct from Matthew, which was focusing on proof of kingship, or Luke, which is focusing on why the covenant changed to church. See, they're both telling the same gospel story. But they're telling it for different reasons. And you've got to really be careful when you read the Gospels to find out why is this writer writing this Gospel this way. Because even when Matthew wrote, and it came out around 30 AD, you know, within months of Christ's death. Even when Matthew wrote, everybody knew the story already. People memorized stuff in those days. When Mary spoke the Magnificat, everybody memorized it immediately. And Zechariah responded to her. She said what she said in meter. Zechariah replies to what she said in meter nine months later. So they already regarded what she said in the Magnificat as canon, even back when Zechariah spoke. So Matthew isn't writing something people don't know. He's picking certain things to talk about to set it around a theme. <coughs> Sorry, I'm using a cough drop, but it's not helping. 
Matthew's theme was the kingship of Christ. Luke's theme is why the covenant changes the church. And both are using the gospel to demonstrate their themes. Okay, but Mark's theme is about signs and wonders. Here's our first sign. Jesus himself. Okay? Now, that's why he's using the word immediately. He's going along the Sea of Galilee, casting that, and he says, follow me. And they do it immediately. Now, why would they do that if they didn't have supernatural proof he was the Messiah? That's the point that Mark is making by using this keyword. Next in order, it's a sign from God. If you got a sign from God appearing in your living room, wouldn't you drop everything you were doing? If he suddenly appeared in your living room and said, hi, go get some peanut butter. Honey, you would drop everything you're doing, get into your car, and go get the peanut butter. Because you're getting a sign from God. You'd be so shocked, you'd just go ahead and do it. Okay, well, straight away, they left their nets and followed him. Okay? He's stressing the miracle nature of Christ is telling them to follow him. It wasn't just somebody that, you know, a stranger walking up and saying, follow me. If there's some stranger walking up to you and saying, follow me, you go, yeah, right, buddy. Something happened. And it had to be a miracle, and that's why the word immediately is so important there. He's stressing the miracle of it. Okay, going a little farther, he sees James. Okay, immediately he calls them, and they left their father Zebedee and went away to follow him. Zebedee is still in the boat. I've already covered how Mark is wrapping the Matthew and Luke in here. This is additional information. Zebedee is still in the boat with the hired servants. They they jumped off the boat. Now why would they do that if they didn't have proof he was God? They'd be disobeying their father. See, their father, Zebedee. That's James and John of Zebedee, not James the Apostle. Okay, James the brother of Christ. That's not that James. It's another one. James is Jacob. Truncated version of the word Jacob. They're not going to immediately leave with their father still in the boat if they don't have a miracle occur. They would be disobeying their father. So their father obviously gave his blessing or they wouldn't have left. The father isn't going to give a blessing if he doesn't see a miracle. So you see how this key word immediately is stressing the miracle nature. Signs, on the right hand side now, signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, you know what? These were miracles. They left because they saw a miracle. He did something to make it clear he's from God. And even their father agreed to it. Because they wouldn't have jumped out of the boat leaving their father with the hired servants to follow Christ if there wasn't proof he was the Christ given to them at that moment. Then they go into Capernaum. Okay, you see, he's not covering the stuff that's already been covered in the Gospels. But see here, key word immediately. Meeting on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. This ties to Luke 4.19. Okay? See? He's talking about the amazing things the amazing nature, the miracle nature. See, they were amazed at his teaching. Actually, it's it, it's Thalmazia, I think. Thalmazo? Am I right about this? Oh no. Oh well, they were okay. They were per, they were upset. They weren't just amazed. Shocked would be a better word. Astonished. Astonished. King James has got it right here. That's both positive and negative. Okay, so he, so everybody really reacted strongly. Why would they do that? Is he no sooner gets into Capernaum than he goes into the synagogue there, and starts teaching. So he's a stranger. Now strangers have the right to comment on scripture in any synagogue they go into. In those days. Okay, but whatever he said shocked them. He was teaching them, not like the scribes, but as somebody who has authority. Okay? And then, next miracle. See, the miracle of his talking. Signs and wonders of his talking. 
hence astonishment, amazement. Then another miracle, man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and then Jesus rebuked him, and then the unclean spirit came out. And again, see, same verb, they're all astonished. First, the miracle of his teaching, and now the miracle of his casting out the unclean spirit. See how Mark is paralleling. Miracle, miracle, sign and wonder, everything on the right-hand side of the screen in Hebrews 2.4. That's exactly, Mark just goes bullet, 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 bullet. Just go read the gospel yourself. I'm not, I can't spend this whole video going through it all. The theme that you've seen just happen just now is the entire, it's the way his whole gospel works. It's bam, 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 bam. You got this miracle and this sign and wonder and this gift of the Holy Spirit. And ba, 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 ba. And the key word immediately is used to stress the miraculous nature of it. Right away. Okay, see? Another miracle. Miracle after miracle. He's leaving out all the doctrine that was taught and just talking about the signs and wonders and various miracles. So now that gives more credence to Book of Hebrews being after Mark's Gospel. So it would be fourth in line. You see how I was really wrong because I didn't do my homework enough when I said in episode 5C that Hebrews was probably first. I'm proving to you now that I was wrong in that video. It's last. Okay, I should have done more homework before I made episode 5C. And I don't know if I should leave it up there to show just how wrong I can get or if I should take it down. You tell me what I should do. Obviously, okay, even though he's not tying to the keywords, all right, I'm going to try and argue against myself in the next increment, but even though he's not playing on the keywords in Hebrews, he's not playing on Mark's keywords, Peter's keywords, or Jude's keywords, he's certainly playing to the themes of all of them. He wraps his text on the priesthood right around Peter's. That I made obvious. You know, you could see it yourself in the text. He's doing it thematically. And he's, he's referring to something only Mark's gospel does right here. Okay, and also in Hebrews 1. Because that was the way Mark talks about it. Okay, that's how Mark's gospel begins. Okay, and we saw that also in Mark 1.15. Alright, and then in Hebrews 2, the only gospel that does this, that talks like that, is Mark's. That's what that's the entire the entire theme of the book of Mark is subsumed with that as it were is his title of Mark's gospel. If you were to title Mark's gospel, this would be the title. The title and the theme of Mark's gospel. Stressing signs and wonders and miracles. See the idea is hi, you Christians are sitting here in 68 AD and you've had proof of all these signs and wonders and miracles for 30 years, a new second generation of you has come about and you're just as dull-minded, because that's what Hebrews 5 talks about, you're just as dull of hearing as the Pharisees and the Jews were who rejected Christ during the time Christ was here. Mark's Gospel is an indictment of Christians. And that's why he's doing bang, 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 signs and wonders and miracles, signs and wonders and miracles. This, the miracle of his teaching Okay, the miracle of his teaching. They were amazed at his teaching. And then to, to show that he's really Messiah like he talked, okay, he takes out the unclean spirit and they're amazed again. And now they debate, well, what's this? A new teaching with authority? See, they're linking the two together. It's like taking the spirit out was a calling card to prove, yes, yeah, see, my teaching is correct. And they got that. They understood that. See how they're linking both of them together? as miracles as miracles so another miracle immediately the news spread about him everywhere and immediately after that they came out of the synagogue they came into Simon and Andrew and now we got another miracle Simon's mother being healed see a miracle meaning meaning bing 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 so are we surprised that Hebrews writes like this to me this is you know, it, I'm sort of being sloppy. You know, I need to do more homework on this. 
But unless I find something terrifically contrary to this, I'm going to claim that Hebrews is subsuming all of the gospel of Mark right here. Because otherwise it's kind of like out of context. See? How will we escape? Confirm to those who heard. God also testifying with them by signs and wonders and miracles and by gifts of the Spirit. He could leave that whole verse out. And still the meaning would be there. But since Mark's gospel is strictly on this topic, okay, then he subsumed the whole gospel of Mark right there. Now, if that's not so, if instead Mark is last, then Mark is keying his gospel off this. Or keying his gospel off this in the book of Hebrews. Because Mark's gospel is a warning to Christians that they're being as obtuse as the Jews were when Jesus was down here. And of course that remains true today. Believers, Christians are always looking for signs and wonders and miracles and every single day they get them. If you read Bible at all and understand it, you have to use 1 John 1 9 to do that. If you understand the gospel at all, that's a miracle that comes from God. And there are certain verses you can read in the Bible even when you're carnal and understand that. But it's spiritual information, 1 Corinthians 2. The only way you understand anything is through the Holy Spirit. And there are certain verses and topics in the Bible that even the unbeliever can understand. And therefore the believer who's carnal can understand. But the Holy Spirit's still working on you just the same. But to understand the spiritual information, you have to be filled with the Spirit to do that. 1 John 1 9 is required. Okay? Because you're not you don't have God in you if you don't um, use 1 John 1 9. You have to take purification for your sins. That's 2 Peter 1 9, which was written before 1 John 1 9. And of course, that's Peter's reference in the Old Testament. And like, like you know, uh, David says in Psalm 32, 5, in Psalm 66, 18, if I, if, I don't, if I don't name my sins to God, he's not going to hear me. Yeah, and you're not going to hear him either. You see? So as far as I'm concerned, the more likely of the two interpretations is that book of Hebrews is talking back to Mark's gospel. But I could also make a case that Mark is elaborating on this in the book of Hebrews. Okay, using that as his takeoff point because his letter is a scathing indictment of Christians of his own generation. But if I were to say which is the more logical of the two, it should be that Mark's gospel come out, comes out first and then Hebrews is just doing this. Now I'm going to try to argue against that proposition in the next increment if I can find anything to argue against it. But as it stands, I would say that it was Peter, then Jude, then Mark, then Hebrews. Okay, and I will try to see if I can argue that it's Mark after Hebrews, if I can find some justification for it in the next increment. That ends this increment.